Welcome to Champion Life Center's YouTube channel. You are listening to the messages from our Guelph and Cambridge satellite. We hope you enjoy this message by Napoleon Lumise. Please come and join us for our worship celebrations happening every Sunday, 3.30 p.m. at 55 Devere Drive, Guelph, Ontario. See you then. I know it's a, it's a weary day, it's a sleepy day, and, uh, but I, I commend you for being here. You know your priorities, you know, your, you know what is, is precious to you, and um, I was just doing the math before, uh, while we were praying at the back today, that given 24 hours a day, in 365 days a year, that gives us approximately, if I'm not mistaken, around, if I remember the numbers correctly, 800, 8,700 something hours a year. And out of those 8,700, whatever, 62 or something like that, somebody do the math for me real quick. Christine is doing it for me. 24 times 365. Eight thousand seven hundred and sixty hours a year we're given, and if we do, if we obey the Lord in not neglecting our times of fellowship, as according to Paul, do not neglect the fellowship of the brethren, as is the habit of some. If we if we obey in that area, two times fifty six. There's 56 a year, weeks a year, right? 52. I was trying to get even more. 104. So that maths out to less than 1% of our time that we are in the house of our Lord. If our attendance is perfect. I'm not going to go there right now. But I need. I want you. I want to share my heart with you. I, I have a. I have, I have a sermon and all these things. But I, as as the father of this house, I, I want to share my heart with you. This is really something that I carry in my heart, and and I know that at times uh, you may not see it from my perspective, and I don't expect you to. Um, <clears throat> but as 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 the spiritual father of this local church, as as your, I carry with you with me, all of you. I carry, we, Happy and I, in our times when we go on dates, Fridays, we try to really spend the day where we can have lunch together. And we try not to talk about ministry. We try to make that our goal, and we have failed utterly. And it's because we talk about the church. We talk about what is happening here. We carry this church in our hearts so deeply that even when we are away, our thoughts are here. Our heart is here. Our heart is for you and, and for what is happening here. That's why we're always trying to be, not only just be praying, but we're, we're, we're trying to come up with ways of seeing every single individual to go through the process of maturation, to go through the process of growing up in the Lord, of discipleship. We, we carry the church with us in our hearts. It doesn't matter where we go. We could be away on, on quote-unquote vacation, but I'm always following up with Ryan. Who was not there and who was there? I, it's still in my heart to call them, and it's still in my heart to, to make sure that they're okay. It's, we, we carry the church with us, and it, I know we shouldn't, but as a father, as a parent, for those of you who are parents, even when, when your children are growing up, they never leave your heart nor your mind. You will always have them in your heart. You're always thinking, are they okay? Have they eaten? Are they, are they, that's the heart of a parent. And all your parents, it's okay to say yes, even if your children are here. Come on, let's just be honest now. Right? That, that's how we feel. And so we know the benefits of, we know the blessing and the benefits of, of you know, as parents, when we ask our children to do certain things, it's not for us. It's not for, our, it's not for our benefit. We ask them because we're either trying to teach them something. We ask them so that it would benefit them and it would, it would build them up. 
in a way. So we never asked our children, you know, just this morning, uh, I, I had to sit Sam down and, and talk to him about certain attitudes. And it's something that we're dealing with with him. He's now 10 years old and, and he's growing up. And I can't treat him like I did when he was three, four years old, where all I had to do was look at him and he knew. The look doesn't work anymore. I would, he would be sitting in the back of the car and he'd be acting up and all I have to do is look in the rearview mirror and he'll start crying. He'll stop whatever he was doing. He, you know that look of death kind of a thing? You know, it's like if you want to see eight years old on your next birthday, you'll stop what you're doing. That doesn't work anymore. And so today we were dealing with him and we continue to deal with him on, on certain attitudes and, and, and things that we're seeing crop up that um, needs an adjustment, needs an alignment. And basically, it's all about attitude of cleaning his room, making his bed. Ten years old, Anna's been doing it. He has been doing it. And um, these are small responsibilities that we, we, we do expect him to, expect them to, to do on a daily basis. And it's not for my sake. It's not for our sake. We teach them responsibilities, and we give them responsibilities so that they would grow up to be responsible and accountable men, uh, man and woman who are of character. And so we teach them these things, not for our sake. I, could, I don't have to sleep in that room. I don't have to sleep in that bed. I can just close the door and everything, everything else is clean. My room is clean. The living, everything else is clean. I can care less about the room. But that's not going to do them any favor. And so there are things that we ask and things that we, our heart for, for, for our children that we want to see them um, move along and, and have these disciplines in their lives so that it would benefit them in the long run <clears throat> at the risk of looking like the enemy. As parents, you all know, you know, there's always that tug of war is, do I do this? And I'm always going to be the, you know, gonna, I'm going to be the bad guy and, and all of these things. But those are risks that we have to take. And our hope is that our children will see our heart and not be angry with us because they will understand. And for all of us who have, you know, who are now older, the things that we didn't used to appreciate that our parents made us do, we're now thankful that they actually made us do it because we're all the better for it. All that to say that there are things that, you know, I carry in my heart and Happy and I carry in our hearts for us, for us as a church. And, and um, one of those is... Just, Spending time in the presence of the Lord, coming together, learning, growing, um, being here. And, and I want to share this with you so that you could share it to those who are not here. <laughs> um, I want to share it with you because I, I want you to understand that when, when we talk about things like this, right now I'm being very, very vulnerable to you and I'm just being very open and, and, and just transparent with you, that our hearts is to see the church mature. And I know that it sounds nagging, and sometimes, oh, Pastor Nab's talking about that again. And, but on the other side of eternity, if we will apply the things that we're teaching, if we apply the lifestyle that we are talking about, on the other side of eternity, you're going to be thankful. Scripture tells us, Paul, I think it was, it says, do not grieve those who watch over your souls because it will not be beneficial for you. Paul being the apostle of God who carries a, a much greater sense of responsibility, a greater weight. I'm carrying the weight for this local church. He carried the weight for all the churches. <laughs> God, you know, <laughs> no wonder he's a saint <laughs> because that's not an easy thing to do. But he says, do not, do not, uh, do not burden those. Do not, do not grieve those who watch over your souls because it, it will not be beneficial for you. And so I want to just share my heart with you. I really want to see us grow in maturity, to take the things that we are teaching and that we are learning about and really do the best that we can to apply them. My, my concern is for the church, not just our local church, but for the church in the world, throughout the world, our, my concern is that we are so filled with knowledge 
but so lacking in demonstration. We're so filled with revelation, and we've got notes and notes and notes, but we are so lacking in the demonstration. And my concern is that we're held accountable for not only what we know, but how, what have we done with what we know. That's why those who have heard the gospel will be in greater, uh, will be held to a greater standard of, uh, to a higher measure, to a higher standard of expectation, higher level of judgment, because they cannot use the excuse of ignorance anymore. We have heard the gospel. If we have heard the truth that Jesus is the Christ, the one who came from God the Father, who, who, who died on the cross on and, and, and behalf of our sins and the sins of the world, and yet we reject that offering, we reject the, the, the price that Christ has paid, then that is when we are in danger. That's when people are in danger of judgment and, and hell. It's because we've rejected what we have been what we have heard. And so I want us to, the things that we're doing, I don't want us to be playing church. I don't want us to be playing church. I don't want to be playing church. And I, I, I believe that in your heart of hearts, you also don't want to just be playing church. We don't want to just come to, to, a, to a Sunday thing and, and do our religious obligations, but then you know, we just set that aside and, and go on with our lives. It's called, it's called uh, I was going to say bipolar Christianity. It's called multi-level Christianity. There's a book about it written by a Jesuit priest. It was really good where he talks about how as Christians we, we have this, this bi-level, this compartmentalization of our lives where on Sunday we're, and in church we do certain holy things, but when the leaders are not there, we, we live as though we are not. And we don't apply the things that, that we have learned. And we just continue on living the way we had always been. And then go on again the next Sunday and live and pretend to be walking our Christian walk. And so my heart for us, and I'm sharing my heart for you, is the things that we are, our values core values, our, our, our beliefs, our DNA, that we would hold on to those things dearly and really try to implement those things in our lives and to prioritize the things of the kingdom because we've been taught, and we quote it often, we seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all of these things shall be added unto us. So that's my heart. So when I say things and when I look for people, when I call people, when I, if, I, if I ever have to call you on Monday and I make sure you're okay, please don't feel like I'm nagging. That's the heart of a father. That's the heart of a parent. You always look for your, your children. And so please don't take that, you know, don't block my number. Put it on the reject list. And um, <laughs> leaving voicemail after voicemail. But it really, we really want to see the church and the, our, our, the spiritual children that belongs to this house really grow and implement the things that we're learning. All right. A couple of things that is in my heart today. I do have a message, but during worship, I just, there's something else that um, just jumped out at me um, that really came to my heart um, while I was reading the same text. But let's, well, God help me get to that. Let's, um, let's go to Mark 1, verses 14 to 20. And I want to call this, just entitled, if I may, Faithfulness to the Moment. Faithfulness to the Moment. Mark 1, verses 14 to 20, it says, After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming, the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. I just love the way NIV puts that. It's just so lively and it's filled with such joy and, and you know, just a, an excitement. Talking about the good news, proclaiming the good news of God and the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And it's just so different from some of the, some of the preachings that we 
we hear at times where uh, it's a preaching on the kingdom of God. Repent for the kingdom of God has come. And it's more of a threat than anything else. You know, it's almost like this doom and gloom, this, this spaceship from outer space, you know, of aliens is coming. This picture of it's on the way, it's coming near. But yet when Jesus, when Mark talks about it, it says, repent and believe the good news. This is good things that we're talking about. This is good for us. This is what we need. Verse 16, and Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee. He saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake. For they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little fur farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Lord Jesus, these are your words. And we just... This is the words of the kingdom, the good news. And so I just pray today that, Lord, you would help me just share your heart and extract some of the truth that's found in this scripture today that would benefit us and it would bless us and encourage us to be faithful where we're at. In Jesus' name, amen. I was reading this, and, and for some reason, my spirit got very excited um, and I just, you know, it's something, you know, when, when, you're, when you read something and it leaps into your heart, it leaps into your spirit, you get excited about it. And it's something that you want to share with people. And I was reading this. And certain things just began to jump out of it and get me excited to be faithful at the moment. I began to think about why, you know, those times that we were in school, some of us spent by the time you graduate grade 12, you'd have spent 13 to 14 years in school. 13 to 14 years, that's a lot of years. And that's before going into college and specialization. Janelle is going into that in the next couple of months. And have you ever asked the question now, even now, why did I have to go through 13, 14 years when all of the time, all of those years that I spent in school, all of those times that I spent doing projects, all of those things in physics and math, and yet here I am now, and I've found what I'm really called to do, and it's music. Have you ever felt like, you know, all of those 13, 14 years, was that a waste of time? I know that when you're in school, you feel like that anyways. But when you're out of it, you feel like, you know, that's always a question that we're asked when we're handling the youth. It's like, why do I have to go through this? I know what I want to do. I know what I'm called to do. And, and they're rearing to go. And some of them want to go into art. Some of them want to go into business. Some of them want to go into accounting. Some, but yet they're stuck and, you know, having to learn all the other little minor classes and what we're always trying to teach them is it's not so much yes you're called to the arts and it may not seem like arithmetic is useful to you it may not seem like you know calculus is of no use to you even now what did we need trigonometry for has anybody actually applied trigonometry in anything that they do right now Right? Those are, and some was like, no, I never took that, I never went to school. <laughs> you know, it's like, some are still, you know, they didn't have to go through that. But what did we need those th certain things for? And I'm, we're always teaching them that it's not so much what your head knowledge, it, it's not so much about head knowledge and what you have received uh, that, that, that may help you in what you're called to do now. It's the act of discipline. It is the discipline the learning of faithfulness where you're at and the discipline to continue to do that which you are uh, responsible to doing even when you don't see it as needful or important in the future. What we've learned in school all of those years, what we've learned, if anything, is to be faithful, to be diligent, to be disciplined in the way we do things, in the mundane 
going through high school, even though you already know what you want to do, yet still going through calculus, having to go through these things, and yet has nothing to do with what you're called to do, whether, whether it's you know, a therapist, and yet you have to learn about certain other things that has nothing to do with your field. It's the act of, it's the discipline, it's, it's the act of doing and being faithful in the mundane that actually prepares you to launch you into your destiny. These are the disciplines that we learn having to get up early, having to deal with, with, with time management, having to deal with pressures, having to deal with conflict resolution with our classmates and the bullying and name calling and, and people in your, group, in, your, in your group mates that don't do any work and you have to do all the work. These are things that you're learning in order to prepare you for that which you're really called to do. And at times we... We neglect the mundane because we're waiting for the destiny to unfold before us. The big thing. It's almost like winning the lottery. We don't want to work. You know, why do I have to wait? Why do I have to work? Why do I have to get up every day and, and do the things? I just need to go win the lottery. That's, that will solve my problem. If we don't learn the discipline of handling the little that we have, if you get a windfall of a lot of money, it will end up destroying you. Because the discipline and the faithfulness is lacking. Jesus in this text now is starting to go about his ministry. He's just starting to get into his ministry. The baptism has already taken place. The affirmation from the Father that, that gave him his identity. You are my son in whom I am well pleased. It, that identity has already been instilled in him. His affirmation was already there. He's now beginning to be launched into ministry. And he's now beginning to learn to build a team around him. A team in, in, in which he will deposit everything that is within him into them. To multiply himself. To stamp them with his own image. He was building a team to deposit the message of the kingdom to reflect and represent him and to continue the work of building the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. He's now building people. He's now building a team that he would, that he knew was going to go and not improvise, was going to go and expand on what he himself came to do. And here we see how he chose those people. Mark 1, 16 talks about how he was walking and he saw Mark, not Mark, he saw Simon and Andrew, Peter and Andrew, James and John doing what they were being faithful, what they have been passed on to do. And I want to just throw a seed out there. I know that we talk about destiny a lot, and we talk about fulfilling God's call in our lives a lot, and, and that is what really gives us our purpose, our sense of existence. But what I'm trying to tell us today, what I'm trying to share with us today is that if we are faithful with the little that we have, if we are faithful at the moment, that in our faithfulness, we can actually run into an intersection with destiny. For our young people, we're, we, we talk and we, we inject this into their hearts. We, we want them to believe about destiny. We, we believe in their destinies. We're trying to cheer them on to, to fulfill God, you know, that great plan of God for their lives so that their lives would not be wasted, but that every day of their lives would be, they'd awake with a certain sense of, of mission, with a certain sense of, of intentionality where we, we want their lives to, to account for something, each one of us want to live lives that will account for something. Each one of us has, we're, we're hardwired in such a way that we want to live lives of significance. No little kid is going to run around during Halloween and say, I want to be a nobody. Everybody wants to be some kind of superhero. Everybody's dressed up as something that they want to be Superman, Wonder Woman, Darna, you know. <laughs> But everybody wants, why? Because it's hardwired in us to live a life of significance. Why? Because we were created in the image of God. 
created with a purpose. There's always something inside of us that's trying to drive us. That's why when we're not doing anything, at times, yes, it may feel like, oh, hallelujah, praise the Lord, I got a week off doing nothing. But how long can you do nothing and still feel fulfilled? Eventually, you're going to drive, you, you're driven by that wiring, that God wiring to look for destiny, to look for something significant, to, our, to make our lives count for something. And in this idea of talking about destiny and fulfilling all of these things, we tend to just wait and do nothing because we're waiting for destiny to fall in our laps. The, the lottery kind of life. We do nothing, but yet we see throughout Scripture, the pattern that we see is that if you are faithful with little, you will be entitled, you will be given much. If you remain faithful in the daily routines of life, it sets you up for the intersection of God's divine purpose for your life. Some of us have found it. Some of us are still weaving through the, the, the traffic of life, the detours of life. We thought we found it. it, it at one point and say and we realize no that's not what brings fulfillment that's not what brings meaning to my life and we try to go navigate through life and and trying to find that one thing but if we would remain faithful in where we're at at the moment and this is a word for those that feel frustrated with where they're at at the moment be faithful with the moment that you're given being faithful where you're at teaches us about stewardship, teaches us about faithfulness. We see how God called Moses. Moses was on the run, shepherding his father-in-law's sheep. He was not even tending to his own sheep. It wasn't even his own. He was tending his father-in-law's sheep. In his faithfulness in somebody else's possession, he runs right smack into a burning bush that leads him to his destiny. Scripture says, if you cannot be faithful with another man's possession, you cannot have your own. We cannot be faithful with another man's vision. When we sow into another man's vision, when we sow into others, God causes others to sow into us and, and to fulfill our vision. Moses was shepherding his, his father-in-law's sheep when he encountered God in the burning bush found in Exodus 3. He was merely being faithful with another man's possession. Yet he encountered God that led him to his destiny. David was shepherding, forgotten in the backside of the field someplace. He was merely minding his own business, doing, being faithful with the little, that, with the little sheep that he was watching over. When the bear would come, he would come and, and snatch the, the lamb away from, from, away from the mouth of the bears. When the lions would come, he would, he would slay the lions to protect the little that he has, his father's sheep. It wasn't even his own. He was faithful in being a delivery boy. Remember the story found in Samuel chapter 1 Samuel 17 where his father, his brothers had been sent off to war and his father comes because he's the, he's the runt of the family. He's the youngest, forgotten, didn't really account for much. His father calls him in and says, David, you need to go and bring some, bring some cheese and bring some grain and bring some bread over to your brothers and go find out how they're doing. And he was simply being faithful in the little that he was given. Faithful in, in what his father had instructed him to do. Nothing world-shaking, nothing, nothing significant, nothing. And, and you know what I mean? It's like, yay, I get to run errands. Maybe the most exciting thing about it is you get to see where the enemy is at. That's about the only, most, that's about the only exciting thing about it. Being faithful with the little task that he was given. Yet, in the faithfulness of the little steps, in the, in the faithfulness of the little instructions, he ends up into, the, into, into this intersection of destiny where he finds Goliath, where he finds this, this, this enemy of Israel and he slays them. Who would have thought 
that just obeying his mother, uh, obeying his father, would lead him to the throne of Israel. Imagine if he wasn't faithful in the little. What would have happened? There'd be no King David. If he, what if he, if, what if he, he was like me? Where if I was told to go and bring and walk, just walking that distance, I would have quit. What if we, nobody would have known. What if we took a shortcut and just dug a hole in the ground, put everything in there, covered it up, went back home and said, oh, everything's fine, they're doing good. Very easy to take shortcuts, isn't it? We don't see that God is watching. We don't see that it's the faithful that he rewards. It's that every faithful step that we take in our obedience, in our, in our being at life group, in our being in a prayer meeting, in our, in our, it, even when we're tired, we're doing the things that we're supposed to. Scripture says to him who knows what to do and does not do it, it is sin. And so we do the things that we know we should do because we don't want to sin against the Lord even though our, our, we're tired, even though we've been working overtime, even though it, it's the last thing that we can give. We choose to give because it's what's right. It's what we know we're supposed to do. In those little things, you have to realize that God is setting you up. He's setting you up to the, to, to the intersection, bring you to the intersection of destiny. Elisha was driving, 1 Kings 19. I'm giving you the reference points, and it would be wise if you took them down and read it for yourself. Elisha is found in 2 Kings 19. It says that he was driving the 12th pair of oxen to plow. To plow. He was driving the 12th pair, which means that Elijah found Elisha as he was overseeing his family's field and because there was no one to work the 12th pair of plows 12th pair of oxen he himself jumped in and began to plow the ground why is this significant because he didn't have to this picture tells us that he was, he was a son of somebody that was well-to-do. They had a field that they could farm, and they had 12 yoke of oxen. He did not. He had people that could work for them. He had people that he could have taken the easy life and just sat there and be the master of them all and telling them to go here and tell them to go there. But he himself was just jumping on and he began to do the work that, he was, that everyone else was doing. And in his faithfulness, he runs into Elijah. God is looking for people that would be faithful with where they're at, with what they have at the very moment. Be faithful. Do not despise the day of small beginnings. We, we don't know what God has in store for us. No eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has in store for those who love Him. We don't know what God has in store for each one of us. But if we are not faithful with where we're at and what we've been given at the moment, we, I'm not going to say we're never going to see it, but we, if we do see it, we're not going to be prepared for it. Because the little things that we do all along the way, it is never by accident. All along the way, it is never by happenstance or by chance. God is trying to prepare you, prepare your character, prepare your faithfulness, prepare your stewardship, prepare your, you, prepare your character in order for you that when you meet the intersection of destiny, you, are, you have become the man that you're supposed to be for that moment. Are you still with me? Amos was a sheep herder. And a sycamore tree farmer. And as he was doing that, he became a prophet. Gideon, we know, this great judge of Israel, delivering Israel from the hand of the Midianites. But he was out threshing wheat in the wine press. He was doing something. He was doing, he was just being faithful with the little that he had, not knowing what God had in store for him. Matthew was a tax collector. He worked for the CRA. See, God can use anybody. He's trying to get you at the right place, at the right time, doing the right thing and being faithful through it all. James, John, Andrew, and Peter were fishermen, and he found them doing something. He found these boys 
just being faithful with the everyday work. In the eyes of our Father in heaven who watches us on a daily basis, there is no such thing as just mundane, everyday work. Scripture tells us that whatever we put our hands to do, we're to do it as unto the Lord. Everything we do is as a worship to God. So he finds these men being excellent, being there, doing what they've just been doing generations long. Pass on from one generation to another. This craft, this, this trade of being a fisherman was just passed on from, from grandfather to father to sons. And they're going to pass it on. And as they were faithful with the little, it is there that God finds them and calls them into their destinies. Come, follow me. I love what it says in verse 20. Without delay, he called them. I want us to just see what we do on a daily basis. I want us, this message is really to encourage us that everything we do on a daily basis, whether it's you're doing your homework, and that's a drag, I know, because I used to do a little bit of it. <laughs> Going to school is a drag, and having to learn, I mean, I, 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 to this day, I still question trigonometry. Why? And you know, you feel like I spent all, I wasted all my life, all those years, and, and for what? So that I have an example for when I preach. But see, in every little thing, be faithful. Some of us are thinking, okay, I've been faithful all this time. But. I, I'm not seeing that intersection of destiny. When I share these things, I don't want you to, to, to think that just, be, you know, you've been faithful, that, that your destiny is necessarily outside of where you're at at the moment. You don't have to leave where you're at in order to be in the calling of God. This is not what this message is about. This is not a, to stir you up to be, un, you know, to be, uh, to, 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 be discontent with where you're at. Some of us already know that we are where we're supposed to be. For those that are already in it, I want to encourage you to continue to be faithful. William Wilberforce was a politician and an abolitionist. You've heard me talk about him. He's, he, he, he joined uh, politics at the age of 21. This was in the 1700s, 1800s. At the age of 21, young age of 21, he, he, joined the, he joined politics and won a seat and started serving as a politician. <clears throat> and as he was on vacation, he read a book that set his heart on fire. He read a book where he found his sense of destiny. He, he, his heart was set on fire to, to do something great for God. You can read about him. There's history books. Great, great story. Very inspiring story. There's even a movie out about this whole abolition mo movement and, and everything that he had to go through. And so he was on fire for God, and, 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 but he knew that he was supposed to be in politics. So he went back to his hometown and, and, and talked to one of the leading religious leaders of the time whose name was John Newton. Sound familiar? We talked about him last week. This former sailor that had become a preacher author of Amazing Grace. So he went and talked to John Newton. This is where I'm at. I, I know I'm supposed to be in politics, but there's a, there's a burning fire in my heart. What am I supposed to do? And John Newton's advice to him was you stay in politics and you figure out what God wants you, wants you to do in the place that you're at right now. What is your mission with the position that you've been given? And he realized this is my burning desire to see the slavery come to an end. This is wrong. This is evil. The, the man was created in the image of God and we are all equal in the sight of God. And he began to go hard after this thing. And, and, and he, was, he was defeated at first. And, and how many times did he try to to move for the abolition of slavery and he failed time and time again opposition after opposition because he was going up against a system that that believed in slavery he was going up against his own colleagues who owned slaves at the time who were politicians and and and, and uh, they were big on sugar at the time 
He was going up against the system, but yet he knew that he was where he was. He was at the right place, and he knew now the reason for why God has placed him in politics. And, and to make a long story short, this man, William Wilberforce, succeeded in, in ending the slavery. And three days later, when the bill was passed, he died. Three days after the abolition for slavery was passed, he died. There's a scripture that talks about David, how he served, David served God's purpose for his generation. That's what I'd like to do. To serve God's purpose for my generation. To live a life, to lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of me. The very purpose for why he created me. But that's not going to happen until we remain faithful. We're found faithful with the moment that we have been given. William Wilberforce did not have to leave his position in order to fulfill his calling. He understood the principle, the parable of the wheat and the tares. <coughs> he understood that where he was planted is the area of his mission field. He understood that in politics, as dirty as it may be, he was there to release the fruit of the kingdom. He understood the parable of the wheat and the tare where we become the seeds of the kingdom that God uses to plant in politics, in arts, in entertainment, in education, religion, the seven mind molders of society to do what? To bear the fruits of the kingdom in that field. How I want the field to be known as, as a farmer, how I want the field to be known as determines the seed that I plant. If I want a corn field, I will plant corns. If I want to see a wheat field, I will sow wheat. If I want to see a barley field, we sow barley. If we want to see a paddy field, we sow rice. parable says that we are the seed of the kingdom and God has placed us in the field of the world and his desire is for you and I to bear fruits of the kingdom where we're at so that the field of the world would look like the kingdom of God how do you think God wants to see your campus practical things now how, how 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 do you think God wants to see the government how do you think God wants to see your company what kind of field does he want it to become I know what he wants it to become because he's planted you in it and because he's planted you in it tells me that he wants wherever that is to look like heaven as it is in heaven, so be it on earth. We carry such a powerful message of hope, this message of the kingdom, such a powerful message of hope and healing and restoration, forgiveness. We carry a message of order, the message of heaven on earth. We owe the world then a sampling of what that kingdom looks like. Being faithful with where you're at, Releasing the fruits of the kingdom of where you're at. When whatever little way you can do that to display the kingdom of God. Be faithful with where you're at. Let's be faithful with where we're at. We, 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 the world ought to see a display of what a child of the kingdom, the creativity that we flow in. 
we ought to be able to come up with ideas and solutions that maybe others cannot. Why? Because we have access to the kingdom. The world ought to see the work ethic of a child of the kingdom. Why? Because we are the church and the kingdom of God is within us. The world ought to see how a student, the excellence in which we do things by. This is not a, this is not a, a message on works. This is a message on practicality. This is a message of let's flesh this thing out. I wonder if we fleshed this word out, if we fleshed out the message I wonder how many more would be attracted to the kingdom of God. Let your works so shine before men that they will see your good works and glorify the Father. There is a way of evangelizing the world with words, but one of the, one of my, one of the famous old-time preachers says, preach the word, preach the gospel, and use words if you have to. Preach the gospel and use words if you have to. What he's saying is that people are watching us, seeing if our confession aligns with our action. I'm not trying to condemn or bring guilt on anyone. I'm trying to just awaken us and, and make us aware that we owe the world a sampling, a demonstration of this message that we carry. Signs and wonders will follow those who believe. Are you with me? We cannot despise and neglect the day-to-day -day faithfulness because we're waiting for the day of destiny to appear. Be faithful with where you're at, bearing the fruits of the kingdom wherever you're at. At school, at work, at play. I want to encourage us. Let's, let's flesh this out. Time and time and time and time and time again, we hear preaching after preaching after preaching and message after message. But how much of it has sunk deep down what we need now is not another message what we need now is a demonstration not another revelation but a demonstration of what we've already been given amen we love you we care deeply about the church and for each one but I'm tired of just preaching, I mean, I've been preaching a long time. What, I, what I'm really challenged to do now is really, come on, let's go. Let's, let's do what we're, let's do what we know we ought to do. If we fail, wonderful. At least we did something. If you strike out, that's awesome. At least you went up there and you swung the bat. Somebody that's sitting on the bench who never got on the field can sit there and criticize you and laugh at you, but they've never been on the field. The man who holds the record for the, for the most home runs also holds the record for the most strikeouts. But nobody ever talks about the most strikeouts, do they? They talk about the most home runs. Let's do this. Let's live our lives before the Lord, always asking the Lord, God, what, what, how, am I, how do I demonstrate how do I practically walk out these things that I have been hearing time and time and time again? There's some of us here that have been Christians five years and younger. Some of us 10 years, 15 years, 20, some maybe 30 or, or older. How much of what we have heard, how much of our, our, our notes that we have, how much of that? Are we walking in? That's what the world is waiting for. When we align our actions with our words, it will give so much credibility and integrity to the rest of the world that they will, they will want, 
it will run into the kingdom of God. There's a story in the book of Acts, and I close with this, where the apostles were doing great things, and the church was beginning to, to really expand and really grow. And they saw, that they, they saw the love and the concern that each believer had for the others. There's that story where there was no need because everybody sold their properties. They brought in whatever they had. And, and I'm not saying that that's what we're, we're, I'm not telling you to sell your, you know, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the heart behind it all. That they were willing to live a life sacrificial on behalf of, of the rest of the body so that nobody would be in lack. And the world, the unbelievers saw this and Scripture says they held them in high regard. They held the church in high regard. There's something about them. They acknowledge there's something about them. And many, in, in the, in after, afterwards in, in the book of Acts, there were many that came into the kingdom of God. The world is waiting for hope. They're, they're waiting for authenticity. They're waiting for authentic faith, real religion. They're waiting for us to flesh out what we know, what we've heard, flesh out our convictions, represent Jesus and represent him well.